Welcome to my talk. It's called TDD for your soul. Subtitle, as you can read, Virtue and Software Engineering. So TDD, just for those of you that weren't sure what that meant, it's an acronym for Test Driven Development. I'm sure most of you know that already. Uh, but Test Driven Development is just an, it's an approach to writing software. It's, a lot of people find it profitable. I, I like it myself. Uh, it helps in a lot of ways in your process. And uh, what I'm doing in this talk is considering uh, what could it mean to apply that process to ourselves as people, um, ultimately so that we don't just become better at coding or at engineering, but that we'd be better people, uh, better human beings. That's where we're going. Uh, if you're in this room expecting something else, uh, it's too late because the doors are locked, so you can't leave. <laughs> you're stuck with me as it is, but um, hopefully you can pick up something along the way, even if that's the case. So, like I said, TDD uh, is this process, test-driven development. Um, and it's usually, you can shorthand it by saying something like red, green, refactor. So red means writing this test. You write a test uh, specifying some behavior. And because you haven't implemented the code to make that behavior um, happen, that test is going to fail. So that's the red piece. The test is failing. So the next piece of that is Getting that test to go green mean that getting that test to pass. So you write the code, you write the implementation you need to make that test pass. And then the third piece is often forgotten, but it's refactoring. So now that you have a test that locks in that behavior that you want, uh, you can feel free to refactor, to rename, to modularize, to do whatever you need to do uh, to drive your code, whatever you want uh, to refactor and improve on it. And that test should still be passing. And so um, you're, you feel free to do something like that. And then you just repeat again. You start again with red, writing a new test. So that's the process of TDD. And uh, uh, I started thinking about this concept of applying this process to ourselves uh, because it's, I don't think you can really argue that uh, science itself, right, the process of discovery and learning, inquiry, uh, these things don't necessarily lead to virtue themselves. Uh, technologists, you know, um, people that are in the know, are on the cutting edge of, of engineering, they're not necessarily good people. They're not necessarily virtuous uh, just because they know how to do certain things, right? I mean, probably the best example of the point I'm trying to make is Walter White. Anyway, Breaking Bad, anyone know? Anyway, Cut, this is a pretty popular show. Glad to see that. You should watch this, not now, but watch it later. Um, but the premise is, right, Walter White, he's this genius, he's a chemist, and a uh, brilliant man, high school teacher at first, but he uses these powers for ill. He starts uh, cooking meth, right? I mean, how, how can you think of anything worse than that, right? So he becomes this meth kingpin in a sense. So uh, that's someone using this brilliant mind, this uh, capacity for science and engineering, and um, not using it virtuously. Uh, but so just so you know, we're clear, just so we, you, know, you and I, we, we know where we're standing. I'm not this person that came into software engineering with all these ideals. You know, I got into software engineering to get paid, OK? Um, I just wanted to make money. I wanted to eat olives out of a goblet. I wanted to have dogs play poker in my living room and have some bodyguards just there, just in case, you know, that's what I, this is what I was aspiring towards, and uh, I couldn't help it through the process of uh, becoming an engineer, you know, I started to think that, that uh, there's a real opportunity here, there's an opportunity for me to do more than just make money and make some cool stuff, you know, there's this process for me to uh, embrace this journey and, and work on some vulnerabilities that I have, some weaknesses, some some flaws, and try to become the best person I can be. Now, if you're anything like me, uh, you will resist a process like this. Because uh, I did the whole time. I still do, even as I try to undergo it. And so, just for the sake of uh, you know, injecting a little energy in here, I, I'm going to try something, since we're all friends. Um, and you're not used to this, right? It's tech conferences, you just sit there, usually you're half on the phone half paying attention. I know, I've done it myself. But I want you to help me out. You know, I want you to help me out today and verbalize this, this uh, natural 
tendency to just resist thinking about our character, our virtue, and, uh, and who we are as people. Uh, and the way I did it, was, and I talked to myself like something like this, you know, but Abraham, I just want to code. I want you guys to say that with me real quick. But Abraham, I just want to code. Let's try that one more time. But Abraham, I just want to code. So that's just verbalizing what you're already thinking anyway, right? Like, you don't want to deal with any of this stuff. And so uh, when I cue you, I want you to say that back to me. Let's try it one more time. But Abraham, I just want to code. All right, so yeah, you know, any animosity you have towards me, just put it into that phrase, and uh, we'll be good to go. You know, any kind of energy is good for me, negative or positive. So um, let's consider what, what the virtues could mean for software engineering and for ourselves. The four classical virtues we're going to use as a framework are, I mean, everyone here knows what they are already. They look very virtuous. People in the back, they look shady. So for them, uh, the four virtues are self-control, courage, justice, and wisdom. Self-control, courage, justice, wisdom. That's what we're going to talk about. But Abraham, I just want to code. I know, but the Hulk, I got the Hulk slide ready. So let's just talk about this first virtue, which is self-control. Self-control. What does self-control have to do with software engineering, number one? Well, when I started, uh, I started learning Ruby. And Ruby is known for being friendly um, and just being accessible for learners. That's one of the things I love about Ruby, right? And, and uh, it's expressive, good documentation, uh, lots of resources. So I'm sitting at Starbucks learning how to code, working through exercises, little um, puzzles, trying to become an algorithmic thinker, you know, working on my use of data structures, that kind of thing. And often, I would hit something like this. You know, it's often I have uh, a nil object, and I'm trying to call a method on it. And at first, this was super dispiriting. You know, I, would, I get really upset, get frustrated. I'm at Starbucks all by myself. That's part of the issue, by the way, of being new is, uh, is if you don't have resources, it can be really lonely. And once you hit a stumbling block, it feels like, you know, you might as well take the rest of the day off. And so I would get very frustrated um, learning how to code. So my lack of self-control came out in that context. But, uh, you know, in general, it's hard to, maybe you're not as impatient as I am, but, but uh, you know, as developers, as engineers, it's sort of difficult to talk about self-control because we often work in places that look like this. Uh, it just looks very indulgent to anyone outside of our world. My dad worked in the sewers in the city of Chicago. I don't think he would even understand this place, right? Like, uh, so, so yeah, self-control as developers, it's kind of an interesting topic. I mean, maybe for most of you, none of what I said applies to you, but maybe this is your situation. It's from XKCD. Maybe, so anyone been here? I was doing this last week, so, uh, you know, so as developers, as engineers, it's good. We want to know the truth. We want to know what's right. And for a lot of us, we need to tell everybody we know and convince them, even if it means missing dinner or, or sleep. Right? Uh, so our lack of self-control can come out in these types of situations often for us. Um, there's a scene from Dune. Anyone familiar with this book, Dune, sci-fi classic? You should, this is really, this is really good stuff. Um, there's a lot of stories coming out these days that bite off of Dune, like hardcore. So um, if you want to be, you know, the good part about being a super nerd is like you criticize everybody else. And so that's one of the reasons I read Dune. Anyway, um, <laughs> in Dune, there's this, the protagonist, this guy named Paul, uh, he's a boy, but he's got these superhuman abilities of, of awareness, and they're starting to come to him. This is the way he describes it. So just hang with me. I'm going to read it to you quoting from this passage. I might lose everybody right here. <laughs> In grasping the present, he felt for the first time the massive steadiness of time's movement everywhere, complicated by shifting currents, waves, surges, and countersurges, like surf against rocky cliffs. And what he saw was a time nexus, a boiling of possibilities focused here, wherein the most minute action moved a gigantic lever across the known universe. He saw violence with the outcome subject to so many variables that his slightest movement created vast shiftings in the pattern. 
Okay, yeah, so, you know, this writer probably definitely did acid at some point, but, uh, <laughs> but what I'm saying is, like, when I'm looking at a console, hope, you know, when I'm looking, when I got Vim open, hopefully, any Vim users here like to see that, too? Um, the, the possibilities sometimes can stagger me, especially as, a, as, a, as someone who's only been doing this for a year. You know, I don't have the tacit knowledge that some of the, some of the people here that have been doing this for a while, you, you begin to develop this, this, these intuitions. I don't have them. I don't have lots of them. So I'm sitting there, you know, and, and just considering, you know, I have some business logic I need to implement. What am I going to do? How am I going to name this? Should I pull this out into a module? Uh, what about state? I have a bunch of friends doing like functional stuff. Maybe I should do something like that. Or I read, just read about the design pattern. I should implement that definitely here. Or, uh, or maybe, I don't know, maybe uh, Rails isn't the solution here. Or, or why am I using Ruby again? You know, all these things, they can churn through my mind. That might just be me. I don't know if anybody else is, is like that. The possibilities can seem endless. You often don't know where to start. But, but test-driven development is actually uh, helpful in this regard because it forces you to, to take a path. I like how Dave Estelle's put this in his blog post from 2005. This blog post was the beginning of RSpec, from what I understand. Someone check me on that, but you can look it up. It's uh, uh, a new look at test-driven development. It's from 05. And he says, it's about figuring out what you're trying to do before you run off half-cocked to try to do it. You know, so you write a test or a spec and then you go out and implement it. So it forces this intentionality, right? This purposefulness uh, about your actions, and it and it, help, it limits you in a good way, right? And so uh, it's it helps you exercise self control as a software developer. And in my resistance to TDD is my resistance um, against self control often. And so what you find is like when you start thinking about this stuff, and then thinking, okay, self control as a developer. You know, how am I uh, resisting these impulses to just do what I want, to just run off half-cocked, as David Stelz put it? But also, am I resisting that in other parts of my life? You know, my dad, the way he described, he taught me a lot through action movies. You know, that's, he's an immigrant, so that was his way. Um, I remember watching Magnum Force with him. I remember this line that a man's got to know his limitations, right? That's what self-control is often about, is knowing yourself, knowing your limitations, uh, and knowing uh, which desires to follow and which desires to resist. Often, you know, instead of us leading over our desires, our desires lead over us, right? And that's, that's the problem. And the more you think about this uh, as, as a developer, as an engineer, you start to reflect on uh, your, your self-control or lack thereof. And uh, you can start to see how you're not, you have limitations as a, as, with self-control as a developer, but also just as a person. And it's actually an opportunity for, for both of those things to get better uh, if you take this path of, of virtue. But Abraham, this is where you start, I just want to code, right? No one wants to talk about self-control. It's even called temperance usually, which sounds even worse. I tried to change the name up, didn't probably help all that much. Um, but we're going to talk about the next virtue. That's courage. Cur what does courage have to do? with engineering, with software development. Well, uh, courage, I think there's two things to talk about. One is there's a courage in just being an engineer, in, in being curious, in being someone that when you see a problem, you don't run away from it, you run towards it. Right? Some of us are energized by these tough situations where we actually don't know how we're going to get there to the solution. You know, sitting there, uh, maybe you're in a planning meeting, you're considering some, some feature, and, and you don't you actually, you don't really know how it's going to work out, but that's exciting. You know, that, that's part of the energy you get from, from being an engineer. And I know I've skipped lunch because I was so into what I was trying to do. You know, and it, that, that, that's a rare thing for me to skip lunch over. You know, I, I don't really do that for, I don't do that for people I like, but um, I'll do that if, if I'm into this, some, some heavy process, right? There's a lot of people here that are like that. that there's a, a sense of courage I think that, that a lot of us have about solving problems. Um, I like how Richard Feynman put this. He's a, he won the Nobel Prize for, for his work in physics. And this is what he said about the Nobel. He sort of dismissed this prize, saying, uh, the, the prize is the pleasure of finding the thing out, the kick in the discovery, 
the observation that other people will use it, meaning my work, uh, those are the real things. So for him, it wasn't about these prizes, but he had this, this courage to do all this you know, amazing stuff in math and physics um, uh, because he had this mindset, right? Uh, I think so. the second thing to talk about with courage is, is pair programming. So that's, those are two pairs. I don't know if anybody, you guys see that? Yeah, you like that. That's, this is the worst slide I have. I just, I love that. Someone made that. I mean, that is great. So pair programming, what is pair programming? For those that don't know, it's two people sitting at one machine, two monitors, one keyboard. I don't know why that mouse is there. That's a non-VIM setup, right? Like, a, but, uh, but pair programming, this, involves lots of courage, right? Why do people not, how many people here pair program uh, all day? Okay, yeah, so you do, everyone else ad hoc, you know, when it comes up, that's, that's how I do it as well. Um, but it's a great way to learn, lots of positives to it, cleaner code often, but I still resist it. I don't know if you're ready to admit that with me. You can, you can just agree with me silently, but every time I think about pair pro programming, I, I still try to figure out if I can get out of it. You know what I mean? I'm like, ah, do I really need to? Let me try a bunch of other stuff real quick. So why, why is that? I mean, for me, it's about vulnerability. You're exposing how you think in real time to somebody else. And th that can be a very scary thing to do. Uh, the reason why that can be scary is, uh, you know, the way you think might not be that great, you know? And, and that's... You're trusting somebody with that, right? Like, uh, the thing is, even about a pull request that you submit, you can make it look good, right? You can review it, you can agonize over it, and just put your best foot forward. Pair programming, it's just on the spot, you know? It's just uh, two people ad-libbing, and, and uh, so there, I think that's why people resist pair programming. I know for me, that's what I have to work against, is, is uh, being overly critical of my process and not wanting, um, to, to invite somebody else into that and just seeing how I really work on stuff, um, seeing how I think about code. I mean, let me, just, let me just get real with everyone here. This is from my, uh, this is like from a project uh, for Dev Bootcamp. And uh, this is part of the, 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 the pre-work, that's what it was. So it's a simple assignment to find the mode of an array. Find the mode of an array, pretty simple. This is my solution, it works. Uh, I was really proud of it. I, I, it took me like two hours. Um, and this, you know, this is last year, just starting out. But I was super proud of it. And in a weird way, I was proud of its opacity. I don't know if anybody else knows what I'm talking about, but I was proud that this was unreadable. Like, I like that. Because <laughs> I was like, I know what's going on here, man. I, you know, that was me line by line struggling with this thing. I got this thing to work, felt great. I went down, ate some lunch, um, I came back, and I saw that um, someone else posted a response, like not a response, but also another solution. And you can see other solutions through this platform we were using. So I go and look at uh, this other solution from Kevin. What's Kevin got? <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it's all right. Like, If that's what you're trying to do, you know, that's cool. Um, but I was upset, you know, I was, let me just be honest. I was, wasn't happy about this situation. Um, you know, I felt like personally challenged, right? Like, um, I felt threatened by this solution. But, but if I had this courage, if I had this courage that I'm talking about, I could look at things like this and be like, wow, let me learn from this. You know, let me see what I can pick up from this and uh, that can help me get better. And also, while wow, it's cool that Kevin is that far along, I can learn from a guy like that. Um, but I wasn't like that in that moment. So that's when my lack of courage exposed itself. I like how Brene Brown put it. Uh, she was talking about courage, and she says uh, in her book, Jane Greatly, courage starts with showing up and letting ourselves be seen. And you can't help but do that when you're pair programming, right? That, that's all you're doing. And what she was talking about is relationships, that this is the key to making meaningful connections with people. So some of us will see, like, we resist pair programming. We, we resist um, mentor, 
being mentored, even asking questions in meetings. I mean, well, there's, we, there's all these different moments we have to display courage or not. And if we're honest with ourselves, we'll see that, you know, I'm missing a lot of those opportunities. And so you can see that the engineering, it's an opportunity for us to grow in courage as engineers, but also as people. But Abraham, I just want to code. No one wants to talk about courage. I just did. I don't know anyone here, but that's, that's okay. That's, that's why I'm up here, I guess. But, but no one wants to talk about courage, really. But maybe you'll want to talk about justice. Let's see. Let's see what you think about justice. What I think justice has to do with coding, well, what is justice anyway? What does it even mean? A lot of people throw that term around without defining it. You know, Lady Justice was depicted as someone that was blind, and, and the, the whole point there was that justice is impartial, right? And also, with these scales, there's a sense that it's about finding some balance, um, about weighing different things. And so I think um, simply justice can be described as giving to each person what he or she is owed. Giving to each person what he or she is owed you can expand that to, to uh, giving to each person or institution or community what they are owed, right? So it's navigating a sense of obligations. And to navigate those, it requires something. It requires a perception of order, of, of a cosmic order that, that informs the norms that we build up. And so we're getting a little esoteric here. Um, we're getting a little esoteric. Uh, Michael Sandel from Harvard, the way he put it is he said, thinking about justice seems inescapably to engage us in thinking about the best way to live. So that best way to live is going to differ, though, right? Among all the people here, there's going to be, there's going to be some overlap. That's the only way we can function in society together. But we're going to have different conceptions of this best way to live. But hopefully, your intuitions and mine are enough in line so we can look at something like this and be like, I don't want to do that. Whatever that is, I don't, you know, wherever you're coming from, you know, there's, there's like a lot of consultants, that's what they do, right? They fly in and write a bunch of garbage and leave. Um, so, uh, you know, the good ones don't, but, but writing maintainable code is about justice. So what does that mean? That the, there, there is a way to write just code and unjust code. All right, and so just code, is at least two things, it satisfies at least two things. One, an obligation to time. An obligation to time, what do I mean by that? So when I was sitting at Starbucks working on these little Ruby ex exercises, I had no obligation to time being satisfied there because I was just about finding the solution and being done with it, never working with it again. But the code that we write in a professional setting or even open source or, or, or side projects, you know, business ventures, anything that's, just, that's not just play, um, and I, I, I encourage people just playing around with code. I think that's a great way to learn, too. But any code that's not just that, it, it, it's not just about that moment. It's going to exist, and it's going to hopefully function in some capacity. And what happens is, over time, requirements change. So the user has different uh, expectations, or technology changes. There's upgrades, right? So time isn't static, but it's dynamic, and, and code is... You're, you know, your, your projects, they're, they're a part of that. And so for, for, for the code that you're producing to be just, it has to recognize that things are going to change. And so I like how Sandy Metz put this. She said, design is more the art of preserving changeability uh, than it is achieving perfection. So changeability, how do you perceive that? Well, it's, it's naming, organizing, uh, pulling things out and abstractions when it's appropriate. Those types of practices and Sandy Metz gets into that in her book, which I recommend. Um, uh, those practices, the only reason why it's worth doing those things is if, if, if you recognize that your code isn't just a static thing, but it's dynamic, it's part of this time, and things are going to change. Also part of that, the second piece is your code isn't just for you, it's for other people. So, so you need to actually think about the people coming after you that's going to have to read your code. I mean, the most selfish way to do this is think about yourself in six months, that you have to read your own code. And if it's, uh, if it's written poorly, you're going to have a hard time. Anybody had that experience yet with themselves? Look back at a project, you don't know what happened, what you were thinking? Yeah. Um, 
So that's like, you know, at least you can do that for yourself. But think about other people, people you don't even know yet, other engineers. Maybe you'll move on from this company that you're at or this project that you're on. And there'll be people there trying to work with the stuff that you wrote. You have an obligation to them. And if you, the just code that you write will satisfy those obligations to them. And if it's unjust code, you know, we're in this situation, right? We don't want to be in this situation, right? Everybody, we're on the same page. Hopefully, I don't know you, but you know, I hope we can all agree to that. And what, you, what we'll find is, uh, in this process is that uh, you start to think about, man, my writing code that, that uh, is changeable and that is uh, accessible to other people, it does it satisfy its obligations to the community that I'm in? And this process can also be a time to reflect upon in my life, like am I living in this way also? Uh, am I navigating the obligations I have to the people around me? Um, and it can, be a, it can be a time for you to, to grow in that virtue as well. But Abraham, I just want to code. Nobody wants to hear about justice. Maybe you want to hear about wisdom. This is the last virtue. <laughs> wisdom. What does wisdom have to do with coding? Well, uh, wisdom is you know, depicted as reflection often. I found this quotation from Confucius. It says, uh, by three methods we may learn wisdom. First, by reflection, which is noblest. Second, by imitation, which is easiest. And third, by experience, which is the bitterest. I hope Confucius said this. I don't really read Confucius. I'm going to just admit that. But the internet told me that he said this, so <laughs> we're just going to go with it. I think it works either way. Um, but what does this mean? You know, uh, number one, reflection as, a, as an engineer can come through writing, uh, reading, studying, that sort of thing. So hopefully you're uh, those of you that are working as engineers, your employer recognizes that you need that time. I mean, how many people here would say they have time for reflection, that you carve out time for reflection? That's really important. Uh, it's hard to fight for that time. You have to fight for it sometimes. But just tell them Confucius said, <laughs> it's the noblest way to learn wisdom. I think that might help. Um, so the second is by imitation, he says, which is the easiest. The imitation as an engineer. I think uh, you pick up a lot of this when you're pair programming, but any type of situation where you're getting code reviewed, uh, any mentoring situations, uh, that's the easiest way to gain wisdom. And I think it's, that's understandable but if we talk about the third. The third is by experience, which he says is the bitterest. So what does that mean? Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of us, uh, we take pride in the fact that we need to learn by experience. You know, I'm not going to trust anybody until I, I see it myself, right? But what Confucius is getting at here, I believe, is that's the bitterest way to learn because you learn through pain. You learn through suffering. You know, a lot of us will never uh, grasp any uh, clean coding principles until we have to deal with that pain ourselves, until you're struggling on a project, trying to maintain something that's been in production, feeling the pain of that, of why weren't these decisions made back then. Once you feel that, then you start to realize um, a w little bit of wisdom would have helped in the situation. For a lot of us, that's where we're at. And uh, that, we just need to know that's the bitterest way to learn. It's, it's a way to gain wisdom. It's just going to be the, involve the most suffering. I like how um, Uncle Bob put this when he's talking about design patterns. He said, design pattern is a well-worn and known solution to a common problem. Design patterns are definitively not new. Rather, there are old techniques that have shown their usefulness over a period of many years. And so this is really, this is talking about coding design patterns, but this is what wisdom is, right, in life. This is, it's a design pattern for living. You might not even know where a certain pattern comes from, who wrote it, who came up with it, what book referenced it. Uh, you don't need to know any of that stuff to use one usefully, right? Like, that's what, that's what wisdom is. It's just uh, a crude knowledge. And, um, and so how are you, you know, how are you growing in wisdom? What's your plan for growing in wisdom? Is it through reflection, the noblest path? You know, how many people here have people to imitate, have mentorship, have uh, good code reviews, you know, practice pair programming, those types of things? That'd be the easiest way to grow in wisdom as an engineer. Um, and while, you know, 
over the years, we'll, we'll gain the experience. But how, how, many, how many of us are thoughtful about these first two things? You know, and taking that further to ourselves, even if you do have mentoring, even if you pair a program, who are you trying to imitate for how do you want to live, for the person that you want to be? Right? Not just as an engineer, but just as a person. Um, whose life is, is worth imitating that you know? Do you have any relationships like that? These are the types of questions that can come up when you start to think about wisdom in the context of an engineer, but then expanding it to your concept of uh, the whole person. But Abraham, I just want to code. Yeah, I know. I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to get out of here. Um, but we just went through the four classical virtues. We talked about self-control, courage, justice, and wisdom, and how those things can apply to us as engineers, uh, but also as people. And uh, the reason I started talking about this stuff, oh, there's, these are some good questions from a, a moral philosopher. He, you know, he says, the, this journey of virtue, you can sum them up by asking, who am I, who ought I to become, how I ought I to get there? And so if you're going to TDD your soul, like that's the topic, right? If you were to do those things, you'd start by writing a test for yourself. And let me just give you an example from my life. I wanted to grow in courage um, as a developer, but just as a person in general. But, but I made this test for myself that I was going to ask more questions at work, something simple like that. And so I, I failed at that for a while. And I, I made it uh, applicable to me, right? I failed at this test for a while, and I started to get it to pass by asking more questions, by taking the steps it took, the habits, um, to be around the people that I was comfortable with and, and the people that I wanted to learn from, and just asking more questions so I could learn more quickly. So that's the way I started passing my own tests for myself. And those, those are the types of things that I'm talking about with TDD in your souls, is considering the virtues, considering where we're weak with them, being really honest, brutally honest with ourselves, about our vulnerabilities, about our flaws, about our lack of, of justice, self-control, courage, wisdom, and then addressing those things, and developing the habits it takes to, to start to grow in these areas. And so I could, I could finish right here, and it would be OK. Um, but we, need, we have Darth Vader in the house right now. And what he's saying is, you know, I find a, your lack of test disturbing. What's this about? Well, my sense is that. Uh, you know, most people are just not going to do this. You know, that's fine. You just, Abraham, you just talked about this. That's, that's great for you, but I'm just not, I'm not really going to do any of that. So, you know, what's next on the schedule, right? Like, I think that's, my sense is that that's where a lot of people are at. And uh, for some of you, I can't do anything about that. Um, but for, I think for a lot of us, the reason why we would not TDD our souls Right, is, is something called shame. Right? Shame. What, you know, what is shame? How is shame preventing us from this process of growing in virtue? Well, shame, what is shame? Shame is, is, is uh, you know, it's often contrasted with guilt. And so shame is, is uh, feeling bad about who you are, right? And, and guilt is feeling bad about what you've done. So you see the difference there? Uh, you know, this question of, am I good enough? When you're feeling shame, the answer that you hear back is no. And for a lot of us, it sounds like this voice. I don't know who's talking for you. It could be a father, a mother, um, a friend. I don't know, pure, someone that you know. Or maybe it's yourself, but there's a voice that's saying, yeah, you're not good enough. You're not going to make it. Um, and, and so if, that, if this is the case for anyone here, if you have shame over anything, why would you engage in a process where you can get even more shame, which is uh, considering where you lack virtue, right? Why would you do that? Why would you hurt yourself even more? Right? Some of you, th this is what you're thinking even Im implicitly. And so you won't, why bother? It's too painful. I have enough to deal with as it is. Um, I feel bad enough about the stuff that I'm not good at. Why would I want more of that? That sounds stupid, Abraham, right? Um, what I'm saying to you is that th there is a process where Criticism, um, this feedback about our weaknesses and our, our shortcomings, uh, doesn't have to be an anchor you know, that, that's pulling us down. But it can be something uh, that we float on, 
and that can take us somewhere. You know, there's a buoyancy that can come in engaging in this process in the correct way, and this buoyancy can take us somewhere. It can be a, an adventure. And that's what the process of, of growing in virtues as an engineer, um, but also just as a person is about, is, is going somewhere, becoming this person, uh, the best person that you can be. And so, uh, you know, what does it take? What does it take for, for that to happen? Well, anybody know who this is? Yes. So I got a lot. Yeah, I like that. I, people know Shepard Book from the Firefly series. Um, there's a movie, Serenity, that came out. So what Shepard Book, he's a, a character, and he's talking with uh, this Captain Mal, right? Mal Reynolds. And Mal is sort of hostile to Shepard Book, because Shepard Book is a religious man. And Mal is not. You know, he's like agnostic or just uh, doesn't care. He doesn't want to hear any of that crap, basically. Right? That's his tone. And, but they're friends, and they respect each other. And in the movie, at a key point, Shepard Book tells Mal, he starts to instruct him, because he knows that there's, you know, it's coming down. I'm not going to give away anything, but uh, Mal's going to have to make his moves. He's going to have to do his thing. Um, he's going to have to be the hero. And, 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 and Book is giving Mal this advice, and, and Mal starts to shrug him off, thinking that he's getting into his religious stuff again. But, but I love what Book says to him. He says, Mal, he says, I don't care what you believe, just believe it. I don't care what you believe, just believe it. And so the way I lean into these questions of virtue and, and the process of growing as a person, also but also having my dignity as a person and resisting shame. Um, these are hard things to do because it's the process of being vulnerable without being shamed. The way I do it is, is through religion. I follow Jesus Christ. I try to live in that manner. That, that informs it for me. But that might, be, that might be the path for you. And for most developers, I don't think that's really the case. But you need to find a path. That, that's what I'm saying. I don't care what you believe. Just believe it. We all need to find a way to lean into these opportunities to grow. We're not running away from our vulnerabilities, but embracing them. Not embracing them in a way where it's, we're complacent, but we're embracing them for the purpose of growth, for the purpose of becoming the best people we can be. To bring it all sort of together, let's talk about the blues. I'm from Chicago. It's known for its blues. And the blues came out of this uh, context of suffering and oppression, right? I love how it's described here by Ralph Ellison. He says, the blues is an impulse to keep the painful details and episodes of a brutal experience alive in one's aching consciousness, to finger its jagged grain, and to transcend it, not by the consolation of philosophy, but by squeezing from it a near tragic near comic lyricism. So from our vulnerabilities, with the right metaphysical grounds, with the right mindset, wherever that you're getting that, wherever you're going to find that, um, you can take these moments of weakness and squeeze something from it. So we're not going to squeeze music. I'm not a musician. I'm not talking about making a song. Uh, but I'm saying from these moments, you can squeeze this, this character, this virtue, uh, this growth as a person. And, and by that means, you can become the best person you can be, not just a better coder. You'll be, you'll be a better coder, a better engineer, a better team member. You'll, you'll definitely be more advantageous you know, in, your, in your professional setting. Not just that, but you'll be a better person, you know? a better husband, better son, better friend, better wife, better daughter, better mother, whatever it is, whatever situation you're in, uh, you will grow. And these virtues, that's why it's important to talk about these virtues. Um, so I hope that you have something to take away from this. I hope you'll take this journey of virtue that I'm on. Uh, hopefully you'll, you'll undergo it in your own way, make it yours. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear them, any, any critiques too. My name's Abraham, uh, like I said. You can find me on Twitter here. Um, I'm, at, I'm working at Centro in Chicago. We're hiring too, so if you want to talk about that, I'd love to talk to you. Thanks to them for sending me here. I, will, I have a little time here to take any questions, if anyone has any. Any questions at all? You guys just want to code. I know, right? <laughs> I told you. That's why, 
That's what I'm talking about. Any questions? No? Okay. Uh, well, thanks for listening. Thanks for attending.